I'm Ed Lengel, Senior Director of Programs within the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy at the National World War II Museum. And I'm delighted to host this program today with Robert W. Fiesler, who graduated co-valedictorian from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where he won the First Decade Award and he's also the winner of the 2019 National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association uh, Award for Journalist of the Year. And more importantly for us, he is the author of this magnificent and very important book, Tinderbox, The Untold Story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Rise of Gay Liberation. So Bobby, take it away. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you to the National World War II Museum for hosting this talk. Thank you to Ed for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, veterans everywhere. So, hello, greetings. Um, my name is Robert Fiesler, and I'm the author of Tinderbox, The Untold Story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Rise of Gay Liberation. Uh, Tinderbox is a work of nonfiction, uh, a civil rights history about a notoriously unsolved arson fire uh, that took place at a gay bar just a few minutes away from the present day um, World War II Museum site on the ragtag border of the 1970s French Quarter. Um, and I have a bit of a presentation that I'm gonna delve into too so that we can take you into, uh, into the depths of this history today. So I'm gonna share screen. And Ed, you can let me know if the share screen's not working, but I think it's working. Perfect. All right. So, um, Tinderbox is a meditation on the consequences of closeted life in America. And by closeted, I'll say what I mean. I mean gay men hiding from public view in a shared conspiracy to turn away. A conspiracy shared by heterosexuals and queer folk throughout the 20th century, which sets the stage for what I'm going to be discussing here. Um, when closeted gay World War II veterans um, would be robbed of their lives in 1973 in New Orleans and their memories swept underfoot. Um, but why dig up, you know, all this difficult stuff at all? Why dredge up the past, some might ask. Well, my first reason is personal. Um, this good-looking guy um, was my grandfather, Corporal Joseph Grisbeck, um, who was a radio operator in World War II. Um, I am a historian today because my grandfather chose to pass on his stories of the war to me when I was little. And when I look back at the pictures of the upstairs lounge victims, as you're going to see as I go through this presentation, I, I see blue collar guys who didn't come from much and who looked a lot like my grandfather, um, who's, who's sitting there at his radio um, in this picture. You know, of the 16 million American citizens and residents who were enlisted in World War II, 10 million of them draftees, no census was ever taken of the number of gays and lesbians who, who entered service. And, and those who were gay knew never to admit it, right? It's, it's a real but unknowable figure. Sure, right, I think about this. Um, my grandfather was a straight guy, if you could tell from this photograph. Um, he, you could see the pinups of women behind his radio. He was a gentleman who loved Sophia Loren, okay? Um, and the people who died at the upstairs lounge fire were closeted gay, right? But their sacrifices and struggles as soldiers and returning veterans, I would argue, were the same. Contrary to the stereotype, right? Although many gay men um, who left their small towns to serve in World War II discovered they were not alone, most were not exposed in the showers, right? And then unceremoniously given blue discharges and dumped on troop transport ships bound for places like New York City or New Orleans or San Francisco, you know, with nothing but a limp, rip, limp wrist and a tube of chapstick, right? That didn't happen in most cases, right? That's the stereotype. Most served honorably and bled honorably for the full term of their World War II enlistment. Um, these are the honorable discharges on the left of my grandfather, Corporal Joseph T. Grisbeck, and on the right of the upstairs lounge victim, John Golding, who I'm going to be um, speaking at length about today in this presentation. And I, um, tell me the difference between my grandfather's honorable discharge and John Golding's honorable discharge, because I cannot find one. Why else? Why talk about this? Because my second reason, I would say, is more principled. Because these acts of memory for our veterans are viable acts of protests against, against their erasure, against who would deny the truth of the sacrifices of the greatest generation, their complexity, 
their victories, their nuancedness, their diversity, and their blood, sweat, and pain. As Zora Neale Hurston once said, delving in a bit more into upstairs lounge history, the, the author Zora Neale Hurston once wrote, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. I'll repeat this quote. If you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Folks, that is exactly what happened to military veterans and civilians in this city of New Orleans almost five decades ago. The arson fire that I write about, which took place at a gay bar called the Upstairs Lounge, claimed 32 lives and injured 15 others on the night of June 24th, 1973, 47 years ago, but this past summer. No culprit was ever publicly named or charged for these killings, for they happened in a different era from this one, almost a different America, you have to think about it like that. Um, one where homosexuality was almost universally illegal throughout the country. Most every American in 1973, not just in New Orleans, but everywhere, believed a homosexual to be something like a, a social subversive, almost like a communist, but in a more private context. Rotting America's family foundations, that's what they said. About seven out of 10 Americans believed homosexuality to be always wrong when polling companies even bothered to ask what people thought was such an obvious question. Uh, because asking people how they felt about gay life when gay was a controversial word back then was a lot like asking, how do you feel about assault and battery? How do you feel about extortion? Like, how do you feel about any kind of violent crime? So this tragedy struck within that milieu, that America, a different one from the one we know now. This is the location now of, in, in the slide, of the, of the current upstairs lounge um, site, uh, corner of Iberville and Charters on the ragtag border of the French Quarter. The upstairs lounge was actually located where the light would fall on the second story. And it was a bar that was actually easy to pass by and well concealed from street traffic, which is what appealed so much to the closeted gay, closeted gay um, patrons who attended there regularly. Tragedy struck stuck in this bar um, in 1973 on a typical summer Sunday at this popular gay bar named the Upstairs Lounge, called so because of its secluded um, second story location that was only accessible actually uh, from a, a doorway on an out of the way street called Iberville. And then you had to head up this winding staircase from the doorway. And this is the site of where the doorway would be now on the street. You know, heading up this twisting stairwell, cloaked in cloth, you have to have to imagine, was a lot like entering a portal in that period of time. Up, up in a way from the outside world that oppressed you, harmed you, told you you were nothing perhaps if you were discovered, and into your favorite social club. Um, and I love this photo. This is one of the, the last and only extant existing photographs of the upstairs lounge regulars when they were together. Um, in between when the bar upstairs lounge bar was open on Halloween night 1970 and when it was burned to the ground uh, in June 24th, 1973, eviscerated. So the particular night of June 24th, though, attracted a larger than usual crowd of about 90 blue collar gay patrons, right? wage earners with much to lose in different times, who were there, there then gathered for the biggest drink special of the week called the beer bust. Okay. One dollar for two hours of unlimited draft beer, okay, plus a returnable 50 cent uh, deposit like token. This is the actual token uh, for the pitcher. This was New Orleans in the 70s, man. People imbibed to excess, okay, shocking. Um, but imagine men laughing, right, and singing in this environment uh, uh, as bartenders sling drinks in this crowded place while a piano player who takes requests, right, pounds on the keys of a white baby grand piano, right? And because this is gay dudes gathered around a piano, guess what they're singing sometimes? Show tunes, okay? Um, these men had a particular song that they liked to sing um, loudly together, crooning almost, drunkenly, to the point of tears, which became something of an anthem of the upstairs lounge. And it was called United We Stand by the Brotherhood of Man. Um, the lyrics went, I'll sing it once. I don't, I'm not a professional singer, but I want you to understand like the 70s anthemic nature of the song. <clears throat> the lyrics went, united we stand, divided we fall. And if our back should ever be against the wall, we'll be together, together you and I. And then they would toast each other, right? Lift their glasses, expressing solidarity at a time when the simple act of being who they were could pose existential dangers 
dangers of being fired from employers, being beaten by police officers, being evicted by landlords, or forcibly committed into mental institutions by family members, right? Those were the stakes. So you got to imagine in this environment, though, this was, which was a haven, an oasis, um, gay couples would be congregating, almost like a gay, uh, talking to each other, conversing. It's almost like a gay version of cheers is, a way, is, is one way to think about the environment in this bar. Um, but some of these gay couples, um, although they would have seemed in a in contemporary context, kind of chummy, almost nor, you know, standard normie types, really. There, wasn't, there wouldn't be anything excessive or radical or effeminate about them. They really walked the edge for their span of time. Some of these men uh, gathered in the upstairs lounge rooms had been joined together in what were then called holy unions or early same-sex mar uh, marriages, spiritual conjugations, right? Unrecognized by legal entities of the era, which would have laughed at them and did laugh at them, um, but authorized by a then radical gay affirming Christian con congregation called the Metropolitan Community Church. The reason I bring this up is because the, the Metropolitan Community Church, NCC for short, had a branch in New Orleans that met oftentimes in the upstairs lounge um, and, and held a worship space there, um, conducting religious services and yes, holy union receptions there. All right, so men in this unique environment, this egalitarian, apolitical environment, typical New Orleans scene, right? This is another scene from the upside, uh, the inside of the upstairs lounge. This is the, the dude that looks like Beetlejuice in the middle is Buddy Rasmussen, who was the bartender and heart and soul of the establishment, a great conversationalist, um, dressed up for Halloween. Um, and this is the environment of the upstairs lounge you're seeing in this photograph, right? Just like my grandfather by his radio had pinups of women, guess what? Boys will be boys. These are, these are pin, pinups of men that are placed in the gay bar. So that's in the back behind there is Burt Reynolds' famous uh, uh, photograph laying prone on a bearskin rug uh, from Cosmopolitan magazine in the 1970s, et cetera. These are some of the images you'd see in a 1970s gay bar, right? Men in this environment are snuggling and holding hands, occasionally sneaking a kiss, although this bar did have rules against, uh, against prostitution, against drug usage, against more flagrant forms of affection. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it there. This wasn't a gym locker room, right? With men parading around in towels. Although, although I want to note that this, you know, sex and sexual expression were not frowned upon per se because this was the 70s man. All right. All this fun happened though, carefully inside this oasis, the outside world being dominated by heterosexual prejudice, and even inside this environment being tempered by the fear of snitching, of gay men in trouble during the era of when gay life was illegal, um, in gay men in trouble with police. Um, or if romantically rejected, uh, ratting out each other to police officers, or jealously what was then called dropping a nickel in a payphone, because payphones cost a nickel then, um, to alert their families and employers of a person's location and activities at a gay bar, right? So there was much, to much at risk just being in this environment. Sadly, to paraphrase Shakespeare, these violent delights had violent ends. So you have to picture the front staircase door to the upstairs lounge opening. This is the fire map. Um, and you turn expecting to greet a friend. Flames suddenly shoot into the room as if launched from a flamethrower, cleaving 44 feet in the backdraft that swallows up the men singing at the grand piano, chewing up wallpaper and decorations and uh, burning hair, clothes, skin, and trapping, and quite literally eating away almost half of those in front of you. Visualize having 30 seconds to choose which way to run. As people scream, bodies stampede, Buddy Rasmussen, the bartender shouts, come with me. And perhaps in that pandemonium, being separated from a committed lover or a longtime friend who doesn't yet realize that this is an emergency and therefore isn't going to make it outside with you. Um, in this fire map on the lower right hand square, um, that's the main staircase leading up to the second story um, of the upstairs lounge bar. And then you see various rooms, the bar room, the lounge room, the theater hall in the back upper left hand corner was where the MCC church met. Um, and this shows um, where, where there's an X and a number, that's where bodies were found uh, by the fire department in the coroner. Um, and there was a back escape route um, that was unmarked that about estimated 35 to 40 people found their way out on the night of the fire. 
Try to imagine, to fathom 29 friends, gone, extinguished, rendered into gruesome carbon mounds and a pile of bodies that some emergency workers would describe as the worst thing they've ever seen. And a fire that actually burned for less than 20 minutes with three more doomed to agonizing deaths in a hospital burn ward. With barely a third of the victims being under the age of 30, young guys, at least five in a century where gay men commonly felt the pressure to marry women at a young age, why were the fathers of young children with you know, little kids who'd be devastated by the loss of a parent and primary breadwinner? Seven of the victims were in their late 40s to early 50s in 1973, which meant they were just in the right window for universal conscription during World War II 30 years prior, when an, an entire generation of teenagers and college kids was suddenly compelled to grow old and save the world. Some of this group had actually wanted to serve but couldn't. So one example is a, a name on the right, Clarence Joseph McCloskey Jr. It's victim number, number 20 at the upstairs launch fire. Clarence McCloskey was a lifelong New Orleanian who was quietly declared actually 4F at age 18, in, ineligible surf, uh, for service by the same draft board that passed his brothers. This was something that was very sensitive among the family members and they would not discuss. For example, if you brought up Clarence's 4F status to his brother or his father, they would try to beat you up. It was considered you were, you were dissing on someone if you brought up 4F status. Um, but what, why did they declare him 4F? Well, it's ultimately unknown, but they could have sensed something different, something medically unfit for the military um, in Clarence McCloskey at that point when everyone else was serving. Um, and, and one way that you could be declared medically unfit if you were able-bodied able was if it was known that you were homosexual. Um, which was then not considered an action, but an identity, something endemic in you. Um, another member of this group, you know, uh, of the upstairs lounge group, joined at the tail end of World War II. So this is Second Lieutenant Luther Thomas Boggs. He enlisted in June 1946, and he served through the Korean War. All right, this is the grave of the upstairs lounge victim. Um, he's known for his World War II service and serving through Korea. Right, but he only enlisted really at the, at the tail end of the conflict. And he considered himself more of a Korean War veteran than a World War II veteran. Yet he is given that honor on, on his grave and he's recognized for that veteran status. So he survived both of these four conflicts, right? Only to be maimed by fire at the upstairs lounge and sadly die in a burn ward of Charity Hospital in uh, day, you know, about 10 days after the upstairs lounge fire in July, 1973. Very, very sad but we want to recognize him. Three of the upstairs lounge victims have records of honorable World War II service. I can't believe we found them um, through the help of their families. They were buried for so long, but I want to tell you their stories. Um, and this is the first time I've actually given this presentation where I have the chance to tell the stories of, of William, uh, Bill Larson, uh, John Golding, and Ferris LeBlanc. So I'm gonna dive right in. Upstairs lounge victim, Bill Larson. Reverend Bill Larson was the pastor of the local gay MCC church that met, met at the upstairs lounge. And he was the most out gay leader in New Orleans in 1973. But he'd actually been born, and I found this through his birth certificate, William Roscoe Larson in rural Kentucky in 1926. So families and siblings had actually called him Little Roscoe back in the day. He changed his name later in life at a time when aliases and nicknames among gay men were commonplace to place a buffer between himself and the risks of his lifestyle at a time when an arrest for a dreaded crime against nature um, was a felony charge in Louisiana. Or, you know, the rumor of homosexuality could cost a man everything. Young Roscoe, though, as he'd been called in Ohio, was the youngest of five and actually grew up in an orphanage um, and started singing and preaching at the local Methodist church at a very young age, around 15 or so. This is the only photograph that exists of Bill Larson to this day because of the circumstances of his growing up. The orphanage did not keep photographs of him. And I had a heck of a time trying to um, build the case for his military service, yet we were able to because we were able to find his enlistment records and his um, 
the rest of his record and his final, all that was left was his final payment worksheet, um, which we utilized to build an entire story of his World War II service. The rest of his records were actually, sadly, um, burned in the, in the 1973 fire, separate from the upstairs lounge, at the National Archives. So his records were destroyed in those, um, in those events too. Um, so, but Bill Larson um, enlisted in the Army at Fort Thomas in Newport, Kentucky at age 18 in April 1944. He shipped out to Europe to replenish the 7th Armored Division, actually that April 1945 and began receiving his combat pay. The 7th Armored Division um, was a legendary unit that had landed at Omaha and Utah beaches and served under General Patton after D-Day, after D-Day among other generals. Um, and the, the 7th Armored Division was then in 1945 when Bill Larson was serving in it, still in, in facing combat. And they were crossing the Rhine River into Germany in a battle of what was then called encirclement against entrenched German forces called the Ruhr Pocket was the terminology. Um, and that battle of encirclement resulted in the surrender of some 317,000 German troops. Near weeks later, um, was VE Day, May 8th, 1945, when the 7th Armored Division um, with Bill Larson then moved eastward towards Berlin to make contact with the Red Army. And then they established themselves in the future American occupied zone, zone of Germany. Uh, Roscoe Larson was ordered back to the States um, in July 14th, 1945, to prepare for actually for the invasion of Japan, as were many of the 7th Armored Unit who were considered low point men. Um, back in the US, uh, Roscoe Larson married his church sweetheart in Covington, Kentucky, while on leave. VJ Day, and later in the year, cut his service short, and he was honorably discharged in April 1946. Then his church sweetheart divorced him that same year for reasons of neglect, right? 1940s code for bedroom neglect or failing to perform your husbandly duties, which caused a permanent rift within Bill Larson's religious family, forcing him to leave Ohio, right? Roscoe became, this guy became unmoored, traveling to various cities, taking on various names, careers, becoming Roz Larison, the Chicago nightclub entertainer, Bill Larison, the, the Bible salesman and itinerant carpenter, and at last becoming Bill Larson, reverend of the MCC and resettling as a religious pastor in New Orleans. Incidentally, Bill Larson, burned to death, trapped in the window bars of the upstairs lounge. Um, it's the most infamous photograph. You can Google it. I'm not going to show it to you because it's gruesome. With his last words, his last breath, he screamed the words, oh, God, no. And then his body was left there exposed. In its gruesome final repose for at least four hours, he became a spectacle for drunken onlookers. To the coroner, he became number, uh, he became just a number, victim number 15. Afterwards, when that number became a name again, Bill Larson's own mother back in Ohio, for shame of a gay son, refused to accept his remains. And so Bill Larson was not given a mu military funeral or burial, as nobody in New Orleans knew of his birth name or his time in the war. And the local MCC church kept his ashes on site until 1981 when two congregants finally donated the space in an unmarked crypt at St. Rock Cemetery No. 1, where he lay in virtual anonymity for decades. That's the photograph of, what his, uh, of his crypt um, for a span of time when I was researching Tinderbox. Until, until, prompted by research in my book and other works on the upstairs lounge, a new generation of his family came forward to claim the man they now call their great uncle Rasco as a beloved part of their past. In 2018, they filed the paperwork with the US Department of Veteran Affairs attesting to their blood relationship and his military service in World War II. And that July, an official military marker went up on his grave. And you can go see it if you want. Something else I never thought I'd see when I was initially researching this book. This is the New York Times obituary for MCC pastor, uh, MCC of New Orleans pastor, Bill Larson published last year as a result following the official VA recognition of him. A man whose mother had refused to accept his ashes, a man whose military service was erased by time, shame, finally received a eulogy in our nation's paper of record. That is the service and story of the life of Bill Larson. 
upstairs lounge victim, Thomas Golding Singer, uh, so Senior, John Thomas Golding Senior, was the loving husband of Jane and the father of three children, Diane, Sylvia, and John Jr. He worked for Nopsy, the local electric company, up until 1973, and at the time of the fire had recently celebrated 25 years of marriage. But John Golding had a different sort of past. Growing up in Rochester, New York, he was adopted by an elderly couple who had wanted to help out a pregnant teenage girl who had quote unquote, sown her wild oats in New Orleans. As a young man, John Golding enlisted in the army in Rochester at age 19 in February 1943, and he became a med tech with the 24th Evacuation Hospital, a special emergency unit tasked with stanching wounds and saving uh, the lives of soldiers evacuated from the field. John participated in the Second Army maneuvers in 1943 Tennessee and shipped out for Europe aboard, and I couldn't even make this up, the famed Queen Mary. He, he shipped out aboard the Queen Mary, passing the Statue of Liberty on January 21st, 1944. On D-Day, John shivered, awaiting orders in a village in Somerset, England, and landed with his unit at Omaha Beach in the early hours of June 12th, 1944. His unit, the 24th EVAC, served the Allies in vigorous campaigns throughout Normandy, Northern France, Central Europe, the Rhineland, etc. And they admitted and treated more than 19,000 patients, 98% of whom survived. Having seen hell firsthand in the war, John Golding shipped back to the States in December 1945 and quickly qualified for veterans benefits. He married his sweetheart, Jane, in New Orleans in 1947 and received a VA loan to purchase a house on Pleasant Street in the Irish Channel where they planned to raise a family and did. This is a hard picture and I feel really, this makes me emotional. John Golding was the kind of dad who would play on the floor with his kids. Although there was always an air of mystery about that loving man, um, and where he went after dark in the French Quarter after he kissed their mom goodnight. As John Jr., who was 11, he's the baby in the picture on the left at the time of the fire. He's a little older than that at that point. This is a, the picture's from the 60s, so this, and the fire took place in 73. Explained of his parents' dynamic. Yes, there was this void of homosexuality linked to dad. That was always there, but mom was accepting of it and very clearly attached to him. They shared a bed. In a post-war era, right, where more than a million citizens would be arrested for sexual deviation at a rate of one every 10 minutes, actually, between 1946 and 1961, Golding risked much in those stolen moments that he sought out at Bourbon Street and at the upstairs lounge where he could be himself, just himself, not a dad, not a husband, but himself. The night of the fire, his wife, Jane Golding, would stay awake in front of the television watching news coverage of the upstairs lounge tragedy with her three, three children who she waked up, woke up to, uh, to watch, uh, alerting them to the emergency. She repeatedly telephoned Charity Hospital asking about her husband, but they didn't have answers. And 11-year-old John Jr. fell asleep praying. Private first class John Golding received, though, a full military honors burial with a flag folding ceremony at House of Boltman Funeral Home on St. Charles Avenue. He was then interred beside family in a religious ceremony at St. Patrick Cemetery Number no. 1. And this is actually the letter of condolences um, sent by then President Richard Nixon to Jane Golding and the family. I couldn't believe that I'd found this because I thought that Richard Nixon was completely unaware of the upstairs lounge tragedy. Um, but here's his letter to John Golding's family. John Golding's death yet left the family destitute and on permanent government assistance. They didn't lose their house, only because the VA loan had, loan had been paid off years before, actually. Jane went back to work, and people snickered around her about the circumstances of her husband's death, and she was actually forced to pull John Jr. out of public school when bullies began to prey on him. As John Jr. described it, quote, we were on the edge. We were always on the edge, but no other ill wind blew that pushed us off. And that's the story of John Golding and the sacrifice he made to a grateful nation. Upstairs lounge victim, Ferris LeBlanc. Joined the army in Sacramento, California 
In March 1943, he'd be 20 by D-Day. His unit, the 665th Ordnance Ammunitions Company, was duly activated in April 1943 at Camp Maxie, Texas. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Um, and he participated in that year's Louisiana maneuvers, actually, which was a major military exercise in the backwoods of the Pelican State. Ferris shipped out to Europe aboard the U.S. military transport ship NY-198 on February 27th, 1944. And he passed the Statue of Liberty on his way to Bristol, where a Brit British Army band uh, and one lone American Red Cross girl provided the solemn welcome. On June 25th, 1944, his troop transport ship slipped the docks of Southampton, destination Utah Beach, and weeks blurred into months on the European mainland as his unit, the 665th, ran Depot 100 for the First Army, supplying Army combat units with weapons and much needed ammunition. They headed west then to Depot 13 in Brittany, and there they supplied the hurry-up ammunition to General George S. Patton as the legendary Third Army made its mad dash across France and Belgium. Nearly trapped behind advancing Germans in the 1944 Battle of the Bulge, the 665th was actually ultimately saved when Patton's Third Army reached Bastogne, I had to learn how to look up how to pronounce that, and broke the counteroffensive. One of the final posts of his unit was situated in a former German concentration camp surrounded by barbed wire fences, providing for Ferris a stark reminder of the stakes of the conflict. Ferris made it back to the war, through the war, uninjured, at least physically, and with his sexuality undiscovered. His core unit, the 665th, actually had suffered but one casualty, and when he returned home, and this is a video of Ferris in the middle, um, he came out to his family as gay and was accepted and loved as a debonair man, a snazzy dresser. This is actually Uncle Ferris at a family first communion. But conf the conflicts, you know, brewed within him as it did for many of these returning veterans and soldiers, straight or gay. 1946 brought actually the first English Bible translation that to include the word homosexual and guess what, it was in a negative context. And though, his, though he was accepted by his family, Ferris's outness existed at odds with his society, and he struggled with being able to bear that love his whole life, common phenomenon, right, for veterans. Decades later, after resettling in Louisiana private, Ferris LeBlanc would unceremoniously burn to death at the upstairs lounge on June 24, 1973. Ferris would be identified among the dead through an anonymous phone caller who was too closeted or fearful to say anything more, and then news of his death never reached the family back in California, in large part because local police never thought to examine Ferris's federal military records. Authorities of that time just could not match. They couldn't square it in their brains. The soldier who, on the left with the man he became on the right. And thus was Ferris, an honorably discharged GI who'd served in the European theater, buried without a flag ceremony, or a grave marker that July 31st, 1973, despite pleas from the local MCC church willing to take responsibility for his remains, the city of New Orleans interred Ferris LeBlanc in a remote potter's field for the unclaimed and indigent dead called, ironically, Rest Haven. And there, Ferris rested in obscurity behind a chain link fence. This is actually the field, it looks like a cow pasture, in a field off Old Gentilly Road in New Orleans East. For years, his younger sister Marilyn wondered what happened, his absence a painful question mark, until she learned the circumstances of her brother's passing with horror in January 9, 2015. Ferris LeBlanc's remains still lie in Rest Haven today despite a campaign from the family to fight Louisiana bureaucracies, exhume his body and bring him home for a hero's burial with a flag folding. The major logistical challenge, neither city nor cemetery can produce the records that would identify his burial plot. The family reports that their campaign, much like the upstairs lounge legacy for years, has fallen into a black hole. And that's what it was for years. The media minimized this event. 
the deadliest fire on record in New Orleans history, the worst mass murder of homosexuals in 20th century America, was worth little more to the city than just a few days of headlines. This is the Monday after the upstairs lounge tragedy, June 25th. This is the first day it dropped off the front page of the Times Picayune. When it was, uh, and then it, it was just a few days of headlines, and then it became a proverbial paragraph on page eight of the newspaper. Officials downplayed it. The Democratic mayor of New Orleans, Moon Landrieu, an honorable man, in many ways a forerunner in the arena of racial civil rights, right, remained out of town in Europe for two weeks following the upstairs lounge tragedy. And when the mayor did, Moon Landrieu did eventually return, he essentially absolved the city of its behavior in a routine press conference by saying, in relation to the homosexual angle of the fire, I was not aware of any lack of concern in the community. Police didn't solve it. Roger Dale Nunez, the chief suspect, suspect, was never questioned by police, though he was located by them, caught and, and released in suspicious circumstances nearly a week later in an apartment a mere two doors down from the ruins of the upstairs lounge. If they'd knocked on doors, they would have found him. Roger Dale Nunez had actually been in violation for probation of a previous crime the night he drunkenly entered the upstairs lounge, only to be violently ejected, screaming, quote, I'm gonna burn you all out 30 minutes before the fire began. Um, I'm gonna burn you all out was the phrase heard by several witnesses. Um, that's what criminologists might call motive. Um, several people testified to his behavior that night, but Nunez was permitted to roam free in New Orleans and commit more crimes, though he had outstanding warrants until he by died by suicide actually the following year. The Catholic Church had its hands tied at that point, as they'd been calling gay parishioners sinners for years in a gay populous Catholic city, right? While also welcoming families and sh shaking hands on Sundays, if such habits could be left unspoken, undeclared, euphemistic among the laity, not to mention, and I'm saying this as a Catholic boy, not to mention the clergy, I'm just saying. So, um, Archbishop Hannon himself was a World War II veteran. Uh, he's known as the Archbishop who wore combat boots, an honorable guy in a tough position at this point. Seemingly moved by compassion, the Archbishop did speak up weeks after the fire in an out of, their way, out of the way column of the Archdiocesan newspaper. When he revealed the correct number of the upstairs lounge victims and the fact that the fire seemed intentional, right? In the spirit of deep Christian concern and passion. We offer prayers for the repose of the souls of the victims and consolation of their bereaved families and friends. This was controversial for people who didn't want him to say it and for those who did want him to say it, right? Those who didn't want him to say it thought he was betraying Catholic dogma by speaking about this. Those who did want him to say it um, felt like this wasn't enough. So this was a man not oblivious but informed, a person who'd follow the news closely, perhaps apoplectically. And the upstairs lounge tragedy, you know, it was so swept under the rug that for decades it lingered in this unresolved way. No one wanted to talk about the deadliest event to strike New Orleans in 1973, six weeks, six months later. And this seemed actually fitting to the average citizen working hard to make this event and its legacy disappear for years. It was considered in a storytelling community, the one story in gay New Orleans and straight New Orleans that was off limits, interestingly. Right? But this legacy did not disappear. This is the bronze plaque laid in 2003 at the historic site of the upstairs lounge fire after local allies spent eight years to controversially raise some $5,000 and place a marker in the sidewalk before the historic entrance to the bar on the 30th anniversary of the tragedy. And it's very meaningful. I see people, I, I get my coffee close to there every morning and I'll, I'll stop for a moment to reflect. And I'll still see people every day pausing anew, discovering this event for the first time um, and becoming angry, uh, becoming struck personally, um, becoming eager to find out more. So I wanna emphasize again, in this present day context, the reason we're talking about all this is this active memory for the, for the upstairs lounge and its World War II victims is an act of protest. An act of protest against those age old forces that continue to not deny a basic truth. Citizens, soldiers died at the upstairs lounge and they matter. It's very simple, it's not, any, it's not a politicized argument. They matter to their families, to their society as fellow members of that complex greatest generation 
which I hope now sits in a more nuanced frame. Um, their lives were contributions. Some stood up when the forces of fascism threatened to end our experiment in freedom and self-governments and erase all human difference. Don't think that because you were Catholic in New Orleans, the, the Germans would have treated you well. Um, many were the troops in the upstairs lounge fire, you know, regardless of who they loved in their lives, willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in the moment that it counted. Since the advent of our nation long before the 2010 repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, one can be assured that queer folks served and bled and died in American military conflicts, although they left little record, right, um, during the centuries of criminalization besides a record of expulsion and punishment. And those were just the ones who got caught. There remains a stunning lack of curiosity, I would argue, on the part of those who wish to conveniently erase all memory of the institutional closet as, as it functioned in our nations and our military's past. This wasn't an institution of quote unquote family values or national security, I would argue, but in a, actually, and I hope you see this, an abuse of those in service um, that disgraced veterans as they had at the upstairs lounge fire, harmed law-abiding families who would miss their loved ones forever, and then wiped all sign of that suffering from the slate of history for decades. If the closet was an institution of family values, why are so many of these families that I described to you today still hurting? It was an institution of great corruption and great violence. So let's return to what Zora Neale Hurston wrote. If you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. As a subculture historian, I found there's nothing more exciting, nothing more fulfilling, nothing more essential than fighting for your rights in America with the truth, the track record of this nation at your side. And I'm emphasizing this truth today. These citizens lived, they served honorably, they died violently, and they suffered in their subjugation. By telling, though, this isn't just to be a bummer, um, by telling and retelling this story, I find we become part of its powerful legacy, part of the personal legend, too, which re can have the capability of reanimating a past event. And, and this is the only aspect of history, I find, over which a listener holds any real power since we can't change the past. But we can participate in the shaping of what happens next and the way that a, a listener be, can become a part of the way of how this important history is remembered. By doing what my grandfather did for me and not depriving those of the next generation of these important but difficult stories. Eschelus, the father of tragedy, the quote I like to say is, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will comes wisdom. And that is the point of researching tragedy. It's not to get sad, it's to get wise. And that's why I think that this history is so important. And in that spirit, let's remember those lyrics of fellowship that upstairs lounge patrons like veterans Bill Larson, Ferris LeBlanc, and John Golding were singing like their lives depended on it because their voices believed in something. Let's remember what they were singing with their friends at a fateful bar seconds before a fire claimed them all. They sang, they were singing, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bobby. That was such a fascinating and powerful and incredibly important presentation. You know, I think and thank you also for, for sharing this uh, here, the list of the names as well. We, oh, sure. we have for the past 75 years in our country spoken about our need to honor all of our World War II veterans. And I think if you'd ask anybody at any time, do you believe we should honor all World War II veterans? People would say, yeah, of course. And yet there's always been an accept to mm -hmm. that several exceptions to that. And this is one of them. And, and here, as you point out, and as you show us, this is not just the case of some, of don't ask, don't tell. This is not a case of 
uh, veterans who were honored as veterans, but we didn't talk about the fact that they were gay men. But mm -hmm. the fact that they, their military service was wiped out. It was not honored because mm -hmm. they were gay. Yep. You know, so you think of this, this is, this is three individuals out of the, the 32, is that right? Who, who died. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, but there, there must be many, many more. You have, for example, on, on the list that you showed, uh, three un unidentified victims. Yes, I take sir. it they were identified. So can you imagine perhaps their families knew but never claimed them because they didn't want it to be known? where they were? It's a possibility. It's, they were burned so badly, though. There's a, a, another possibility that there are those who wanted to, to reclaim them and just were never able to. Um, and that's sad as well. There's a list of, uh, of possible um, matches, uh, more than three, actually, for the three unidentified bodies, which complicates the matter, too. Um, so there's, name, uh, there's a man named Norman Laverne, Reginald Tubbs, um, Larry Frost, or some names, um, and families have stepped forward who lost loved ones in ways that are inexplicable to them around the time of the fire. Um, and I do want to honor them stepping forward to acknowledge that they had loved ones that they lost. But yeah, that, that, sadly enough too, uh, Ferris LeBlanc, the private, uh, the army private who was buried in Rest Haven, um, was actually buried with the three unidentified victims. Um, so he was only identified at the last minute by an anonymous caller who uh, was able to ID him through a unique silver ring that he had wearing on his finger when he died. Um, and then because LeBlanc is such a common last name in Louisiana, local yeah. authorities didn't move, they didn't try any harder than searching around the local area. They didn't think that if they searched, you, if you searched LeBlanc, like in the World War II enlistment records, he's the only one. Like I, it's, it's, um, it's tough, but, um, so the family, um, that they've, been, they've been trying since they found out in 2015 to exhume him and to bring him and give him a proper send off. Um, and they, uh, honestly, if there's any World War II organizations with funds or anything like that, um, the family does need help um, to pursue those. Uh, they're gonna have to pursue certain legal remedies probably in order to, to make that happen. We have several questions. I have one question, uh, though, for you from myself. I've been wondering, do you think the upstairs lounge bar was a dangerous location for a fire because it was a gay bar, because it, because it had in, at that time to be kind of out of the way, because it had to be, you know, kind of a restricted entrance, restricted access? Is that fair to say? Sure. Some of the aspects that provided its concealment, such as the, the winding stairwell that had served as the lone entrance and exit, such as the red burlap fabric that had been clothed, coked on the walls that was all flammable, um, and such as uh, even window bars that were placed on uh, the Charter Street side windows that were a supposed safety feature approved by city inspectors. All of those in the end became um, terrible hindrances that, that quickly transformed the, a person's greatest haven, their favorite bar, into a veritable prison for a span of minutes while they burned alive. Um, the upstairs lounge, I will say, wasn't, it's not in the 70s, wasn't the only, you know, dangerous bar, gay bar or straight, in these old buildings close to the French Quarter. Um, at a time, too, where city inspectors um, didn't, re um, oftentimes could be um, rendered unto Caesar, um, could be convinced uh, through the proper application of resources, I'm, I'm trying to not say bribe, um, into uh, avoiding a certain span of uh, safety inspections for a certain span of time for an, for an establishment. And the upstairs lounge fire, when it burned, hadn't been an inspected by the city in several years. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Barbara Neri, first of all, she says, thank you so much for your passion and for telling the story the way you have. And then she has a couple of questions, one of which is, fairly uh, simple question and another, another I think, uh, more complex. One is she wants to know if ten you know if Tennessee Williams ever uh, visited that bar. And I guess there's probably no way of knowing since he didn't come out publicly until the 80s. Yeah, there's no way of knowing. I would say, though, because um, Tennessee was an A-gay um, and he was part of a, an aristocratic gay class that was moneyed. Okay. Um, it's unlikely that he would have made his way 
to a bar that was the, the gem of a very rough street. Iberville was known as a hustler street and a place for low level crime, led a mafia activity. I, I have never heard of Tennessee Williams drinking at the upstairs lounge. As far as I know, Tennessee Williams liked to drink at Dixie's on Bourbon Street and also Cafe Lafitte in Exile. Okay, interesting. You did say it was a blue collar kind of clientele. Yeah. Uh, and then she asks, how did the World War II soldiers reconcile their devoted service and love of country with the oppression of homosexuals? The Nazis were killing them in concentration camps. How did they process all of this? And I guess you can only imagine how they processed I would imagine it was later in life. Um, the, the, the sense that there was a way that they could embrace their, their, their early desires when they were young um, would have been uh, difficult to understand. Some of them may have been aware that they liked other men when they were in service, um, and certainly and they were in all-male atmospheres. Um, but um, oftentimes, I think that most of the stories for these, uh, for the, uh, these upstairs lounge victims is that they really discovered their sexuality and embraced it after the war. Um, they weren't out um, by any means um, in the military service. Um, and in some cases, they, uh, I, would, I would imagine that these individuals had a very limited understanding at age 17, 18, 19, et cetera, of who they were at that point until the war made them grow older very fast. That's, that's so interesting. And I think from, from the historian's point of view too, you know, nothing has been done, no real work has been done until recently to, to study the experience of of gay men in the military during World War II, but I think even even more, you know, the millions of returning veterans had to to try to reintegrate into society. They mm -hmm. had to try to find fellowship, whether with families or community. And for for most, you know, other veterans, I imagine that that would have been somewhat more straightforward and uh, how they how they could do that. But for gay veterans or veterans who were in the process of coming to recognize that they were gay. Uh, it must have been so much more complicated uh, and mm -hmm. taking place all over the country underground during this period. Oh, certainly, certainly. And then post-World War II though, so a lot of, a lot of gay men had, found, uh, had discovered there were others or had the sense during the war that there were others like themselves. And then it was after World War II that, that you had the first really large urban queer population boom of gays and lesbians taking place in major cities, which then provoked the backlash of moralism and um, anti-queer and anti-sodomy laws and, and, right. and local ordinances that, uh, that then took place during the late 40s. It was called the Lavender Scare, was the anti-queer pair of the Red Scare. Mm -hmm. um, and that continued on through the sexual revolution. Um, Brian Giroux on Facebook wants to know, why was the story of the upstairs lounge fire taboo? Why didn't anyone want to speak of it for so long, aside from the obvious? I know you've touched on much of this sure. already. Don't say any more about it. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, for, it didn't make the city look good from a straight or closeted gay perspective. So New Orleans had long nurtured um, a semi-closeted niche of gentlemen who preferred gentlemen or bachelors, et cetera, who lived euphemistically and had a lot of fun in social events, but were apolitical um, and never declared themselves uh, brazenly in public. This, this wasn't a city that had pride parades, et cetera. The, the notion that uh, in New Orleans was that you would be, you would be avoided, uh, afforded a safe corner if you came to town. Um, and that was the, but there were still consequences if it became known or uh, that you were gay or you were arrested or your employer came to, to understand your private life. So that's the reason why when people came to New Orleans, when parents either shipped their children off to New Orleans or people ran away here to, to start new chapters of their lives um, or stages of their lives, people would oftentimes, like Bill Larson, change their name slightly so as to disconnect themselves, sever themselves from the previous life that had hurt them so. Um, so that's amongst gay New Orleans, uh, the, the fire and the, the, the resulting um, oppression and the disrespect for the victims that followed in the aftermath, in some ways pushed closet, the semi-closeted gay New Orleans society further into the darkness and further into the sense that this is what happens um, if you stick your neck out and if, it, if, if the truth of your life becomes known. Um, and so amongst closeted gay, so, so such as um, upstairs, the upstairs lounge owner, Phyllis Stevie, 
um, for, uh, for years would try to hush all talk of the upstairs lounge tragedy and, and, any, and especially any association of, politi of political act, gay political activity, trying to make the upstairs lounge a kind of um, cause de celebre or a kind of rally cry. No one in New Orleans wanted that because they thought it was gonna cause more trouble. Um, and then straight New Orleans, um, who had, which had known and understood um, and been Janice faced about a wide range of vices that had existed um, uh, for decades, if not centuries in town, um, did not want um, news of a, in a, in a city that was gonna be increasingly reliant on the tourist dollar. Um, this was, New Orleans was the place where you would come for consequences for your weekends, et cetera. They did not want um, news of a bar burning by the French Quarter, killing a bunch of people, and then the fact that it was a homosexual bar, and then the fact that the, most of the victims were locals, they did not want that to be um, uh, publicized in a, in a protracted way about their town. That was simply the wrong image that they wanted to put forward. And also straight New Orleanians liked the power structure and they wanted to keep enforcing the semi-closeted niche as it had existed. And this is New Orleans, I mean, and you, it gives you a hint of New Orleans in the 1970s, if all of this is going on, how it must have been at the same time in New York, in Washington, D.C., and in the country's other more straight-laced cities, um, you know, for, for gay men, including many World War II veterans, to, to find places to express themselves openly. Um, yes. So Another couple of questions here. Uh, did any of these individuals who survived the fire in the lounge keep a diary or personal journal which informed your work? And you, can you discuss how you worked with some of the victims' families for the book? Sure. Um, so to my knowledge, no, none kept a diary that, that's at least yet surfaced. Um, so uh, how I conducted the research for the book was that I, um, I used a sort of Venn diagram, you could say, a giant Venn diagram that had probably thousands of different pieces of, pieces of evidence, police reports, insurance fire maps, fire marshal reports, interviews, military records, which are all requestable via Freedom of Information Act, um, locations of grave sites, and then um, phone books were very helpful for back in the day where you would see where a person lived and then you could also see for matching last names and then you could find family members. Um, birthdays are very, are very good ways to start searching individuals um, and then locating them in the present day. So I, I compiled a list of individuals who died at the upstairs lounge fire and then I compiled the list of individuals who survived. Um, I had to try to guess of the people who survived the fire in 1973 who might be pre living today, um, who passed away in the, you know, in the, the subsequent years. Then from there, I would circle back and try to talk to these, these people. I would reach out, I'd say who I was, my, the project I was doing, I would go, you know, and I would tell them that this would be the very difficult task of reliving the worst thing that ever happened to you, uh, an event in your life that cleaved it into before and after. Um, and then I, I found out whether or not individuals had been uh, heads of family when they died in the fire. Then from there, you can research marriage certificates, wives, and then you can find if there were any children that were the fruit of that marriage. And then I sought out the children to speak to them. Um, I thought their testimony, which um, sadly hadn't been included as much in a lot of uh, previous upstairs lounge tellings, be, and, and in some reasons, just because there's so, the, the scope of the carnage was so wide and there were so many victims. There are so many ways to look at this event um, that I thought the testimony of the children, um, most of whom are, are still alive, um, would be powerful. And so I would include and take oral history interviews. Then you would take that, use that as one piece of evidence that you place in a Venn diagram and try to find the cross section of three or four pieces of evidence, which is the closest thing that you can get to the truth when reconstructing historical scenes. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I had to make, make the decision of whether or not I was going to write a book uh, that was academic or I was going to do a scene construction thing, a you were there sort of format. And I decided that scene reconstruction was important, though risky, and that as much as I could reconstruct the past to place people in, this, in the lived experience or the cinematic reality of the gay underworld of 1973 New Orleans, that that would be emotional and powerful for readers. And so that's kind of how I went about researching this and putting it together. 
And that's one thing I want to say too about this book. And in addition to being, you know, important and courageous, this is a really great piece of research uh, from a journalist or from a historical perspective. Your research on on this book and your determination and uncovering these stories is just incredible. Um, so Marcus, okay. oh sure. Um, Marcos Rodriguez from Facebook says, uh, I got to the conversation late, so you may have expressed it at the beginning. I actually don't think you did. Uh, but what was your connection interest to find out about this event? And thanks for your efforts. Um, I was a closeted gay kid that grew, grew up in 1990s Chicago suburbs um, in an evangelical Christian community where no models for queer life existed. So um, I became, I, that little boy grew into a subculture reporter that was constantly um, obsessed with falling into, willingly falling into cracks in our society to try to report the marginal and the obscene, the, uh, the unseen. Um, but I'd, I'd never, maybe I just wasn't brave enough at, for a certain span of time, but I never reported on the gay, on gay society in, in America when it was a subculture. And so when I found out about the upstairs lounge fire, the notion that these men had in essence lived split in certain ways, embracing only their full selves within the haven of the bar and then living some version or mask of themselves in other, other places, I got obsessed. I couldn't stop myself. I mean, like this happens with journalists or not, but you, you're kind of like a hunter and you catch the scent and that's it. It's like a meteor that crashed into your life. But, um, once I was introduced to the event, and I was by, um, I had a journalism professor um, at my school in New York that happened to have been a baby reporter in the 1970s French Quarter when this mysterious fire occurred. Um, and then once I received that initiation, that initial bite, that's all it took. Great. Well, this, uh, I think we'll wrap up with this question, which will also give you an opportunity for any summary remarks. And I think this, this is a primary question I'd, I'd love for you to address. Catherine Moser from Facebook asks, why is this 1973 lounge fire important to World War II cause and effect? Mm. I mean, it's important in so much as it tells the story of veterans, honorably discharged veterans, and what happens to them. Mm -hmm. um, the, vet the, the victims of the upstairs lounge fire um, in the aftermath of the, this emergency moment, were denied all the ordinary honors of a GI, of a, service, of a serviceman. And from a journalistic perspective and a human perspective, uh, that's not just horrific to me, but that's fascinating when one considers that, um, are there circumstances in your life where your important military service can be suddenly denied you um, by someone? And I, I think that, that that is why this is important to World War II history. Um, this isn't like a mainline book where I'm, I'm saying that if you want to find out about World War II history, read Tinderbox about a 1973 fire at a gay bar. But this is, a, this is another way of looking at um, what happens to veterans, how are veterans treated, yeah. um, does the recognition of their service continue in a way that is lifelong, or does society stop it in a way that's haphazard? And in the case of the upstairs lounge tragedy, where you see what happened to upstairs lounge victim, Bill Larson, whose remains uh, were not even interred into 1981, and he still hasn't received um, a military flag folding ceremony or any, anything at his gravesite, or what happened to Ferris LeBlanc, who was buried in, a, in what's still an unmarked potter's field. Um, one can see that the status of veterans, the troops that matter so much to people who like to hoist them up for political purposes, um, can waver if an individual wants to deny it. And I think that's wrong. I'm the, I'm the grandchild of a World War II veteran who loved General Patton. I had to watch the movie Patton all the time and it never sat right with me that it went a World War II veteran who in essence saved the world for people like myself who would not be, I, you would, I would not be talking here if the Germans had won. Uh, believe it or not, or at least not in the capacity where I'm able to be out and open and wear a little rainbow band. And I think that um, it's important, therefore, that we think about what happens to veterans um, and whether or not we are continuing to honor their sacrifice. Very articulately spoken and passionately said, I, I agree completely. I mean, we, we want to honor all World War II veterans without exception. And this 
speaks to the experiences of many, many thousands of World War II veterans, both during and after the war. So uh, Robert Fiesler, Bobby, uh, author of Tinderbox, thank you for such a wonderful presentation and all with your book and your next work of research, which I'm sure is going to be every bit as good as this one. Thank you. I've done a couple of cool things with this book, but I just want to say this was the most special thing I've ever done. This was very meaningful to me. And thank you to the National World War II Museum for allowing me to tell these stories. Thank you.